Hey everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the Smart Grid Forum's webinar on cyber securing digital substations. My name is Mandana White and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. So now I'd like to introduce to you our first session, uh, which is on the topic of the latest trends in cyber physical security for legacy and new substations. And this will be delivered by Arcade Scamino, who is Industrial Cybersecurity Manager at Accenture. So, Arcade, so I'd like to invite you on the screen now. Hello, welcome. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Arcade Scamino. I'm going to talk about the uh, next generation substation or the digital substation. So uh, basically, we will start covering the threat landscape that uh, we are facing in, in in our critical infrastructures, in substation and, and in utilities, generally speaking. After that, uh, we will go into some specific uh, technical details about the substation and the protocols that uh, we are using in this specific domain. And uh, then, and, and last but not least, we will cover the, some specific things in order to protect these, uh, these, uh, these infrastructures and uh, in order you know to to be more resilient and we will talk about the, the resilience because i think that this this is the the key point so uh we we live in a in a digital world everything is is connected our infrastructure are getting more and more connected even we are uh, deploying new uh, devices such as iot and iot and in some way uh, we are connecting our infrastructure to the internet maybe in some way uh, uh, to, to the internet that we are using uh, also this TCP IP protocol. So uh, they are very well known to, to, to the attacker. So taking all this into consideration, we, we need to, uh, to protect our uh, infrastructures uh, accordingly to, to this uh, new paradigm. So uh, you have there some of the recent uh, attacks against uh, smart grids and, and critical infrastructures. And on one hand, uh, or I have selected these ones because, I mean, uh, they have different goals, they have uh, different, uh, uh, we would say the, the attack chain of uh, this, uh, this uh, malware, but it's important to, to understand all of them. So on one hand, we have the, the ENSO, and in this, uh, in this specific uh, attack, the malware was oriented just to the IT side, okay? So the, the goal was to steal information. So uh, in the attack chain, the attackers stop it in the uh, IT side of the of the. On the other hand, we have the black energy and the, the Ukraine one that this was oriented to the OT side of the organization. So here we are talking about uh, crossing or, or uh, taking impact in the physical process. Okay, in in the power in the. Process. And uh, in the in the middle, let's say we have the Saudi Aramco one that this is very interesting because it was a one step ahead. And here we are not talking uh, even the IT or OT, but safety systems. As, as, and as you know, uh, if we are talking about safety system, we are talking about the the human uh, the human being lives. Okay, so uh, this is like a game changing. So we have to to have clear that uh, the the attackers are uh, getting more and more uh, to this kind of uh, new infrastructure connected. So I would like to uh, to highlight crash override malware because uh, yeah, this is a very complex crash, uh, malware. And we need to understand that behind this uh, malware, there are a lot of work, uh, a big budget to work on this, a big team. This is like a, like a cybersecurity company, let's say, uh, to, the, to develop this kind of malware. But basically, uh, this malware, uh, like four or five modules, uh, and it, it supports the, the typical protocols that we are using in the field, IEC 101, IEC 104, IEC 01850, OPC. So as you know, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of work in, in here uh, in this malware. It, 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 uh, it can uh, send command directly to our RTUs, block serial port of Windows devices. So as you can see, uh, it uh, combines specific IT uh, devices and protocols, but also very specific industrial protocols such as IEC 104 or, or IEC 01850. Moving ahead, and if we are talking about protecting our substation or critical infrastructure, this is not only about uh, tech technology, but also about process and, and, and personal. And this is very important because uh, I, I'm going to start with the uh, people and, and process because we are seeing a lot of uh, a lot of gaps in, in here. For example, uh, 
uh, going to the roles and responsibility also to, to the governance. Uh, we, we see in our clients and in general speaking in, in utilities that they are very focused on the OT industry or to, to the OT side or to the industrial part or maintenance or but nothing related to cybersecurity team. So this is very important because we need to include uh, cybersecurity in our uh, in, in our company. And if we are talking about roles and responsibility, responsibilities, we need to include uh, cybersecurity roles and responsibilities in here. Uh, then it's not easy to find the right skills in terms of cybersecurity and uh, combining, let's say, with this specific domain knowledge because it's super specific. And to have the right persons to uh, to have both uh, or to understand both languages, the OT side and the cybersecurity is not uh, is not easy. Uh, and then, uh, and this is very important because we, we have been focused on, on, on monitoring tools and uh, gathering all the alerts, but uh, more than that, we need to focus on the process once that we detect, uh, detect that alert. And this is also very important to, to have a team and, and a process uh, to stop uh, the attack once that, that uh, we receive uh, an alert. Moving forward to the technology part, and this is uh, very important because uh, protecting a service station is not an easy task. We have legacy devices that are, they are insecure, insecure by default, and they are not easy to, to protect. We are also opening to uh, our devices to uh, or our infrastructure to, to third parties, and we are having a lot of attacks uh, using this, uh, this chain. And then uh, we don't have like a, a very... Uh, cybersecurity architecture that we can follow. There are a lot of standard best practices, but let's say that we don't have a unique standard to, to follow and to have everything uh, protected and following uh, the, the best uh, practice in order to, to protect our infrastructure. And then the protocols that we have here in the service station, they are not, uh, or, or most of them, they are not secure by default. Uh, it's difficult to protect this kind of protocols that they are not uh, thinking in, in security. So if we go into some details about the specific IEC uh, 61H50 protocol, uh, it has four profiles. The first, the, the two first ones, SMV and Goose, they are uh, there for uh, real-time connections. Then we have the SNTP for the, uh, NT, the, the typical uh, NTP protocol to, to synchronization, for, it's used for synchronization. And then we have the that this is uh, to, to gather the information, to change the configurations. Basically, it's the, the, the one that we use to read all the information from, from our infrastructure. But uh, this protocol, is, it, it, it has some weaknesses in terms of cybersecurity, and we can perform some attacks such as flood, injection, package ca capture, or even money in the middle. Okay, so basically, this protocol is not is not uh, thinking uh, about uh, cybersecurity, but to cover that part of cybersecurity and, or to complement the IEC 61850 protocol, we are using the IEC 62351 protocol to include uh, cybersecurity requirements. And in this case, we are talking about uh, encrypt uh, the communications using authentication. So the typical uh, cybersecurity requirements that we can uh, uh, inject or in, in, our, uh, in our service station. This is important because the, the products or the, the, uh, all the devices that we have in, in, the, uh, in the service station should be uh, compliant with, uh, with these protocols if we want to use it. And then, and from my point of view, it's key uh, to have a security architecture. This is the base. We cannot go uh, to monitor uh, or to deploy any uh, cybersecurity technology if we don't have a security architecture. Because, uh, for example, if we if we got an alert coming from our monitoring solution, and if we have like a a, a, a plan a architecture, it's it's impossible to stop the attacker because everything is open. Okay, so we we should focus first on having this secure architecture. Uh, hardening, uh, uh, giving uh, secure remote access, defining zones and conduits in order to connect all the all the devices and all the stuff that we have in the service station, but thinking in this uh, secure architecture. And the, the 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 biggest goal in here is about increasing our resilience. And I'm, I'm not talking about uh, cyber resilience, but because from my point of view, it doesn't make sense 
we need to talk about resilience, okay? Because uh, security is in one. We cannot focus just in cyber or in physical or in OT, okay? So we need to have the whole view of security, uh, physical security, IT security, OT security. So at the end of the day, we cannot talk about cyber resilience, but resilience. And that, that's our goal, to improve our resilience. And for that, uh, we have here some key points. And if we combine the active defense with, with the defense in depth, this is very, very, very important and super useful technique and approach in order to protect our substations and uh, our, our infrastructures. So what does it mean? Uh, first, we need to understand what we have. And here I'm talking about uh, having inventory assets, monitoring tools, but uh, also we need to introduce uh, some technology, te technological devices and cybersecurity devices in order to protect. And this combining uh, with, with a defense in depth, we can uh, establish some layers so we can detect the attackers before they have a huge impact in our infrastructure. Okay, so if we combine these monitoring solutions with the security architectures, in different layers, we can stop attackers before uh, they gain our OT side or our, our business. Because at the end of the day, we are talking about our business, our physical process. Then commissioning, it's very important because we, if, we are, if we have our infrastructure secure, but if we are introducing or deploying new devices that they are insecure by default, we are opening the doors to, to the attackers. So we need to include cybersecurity requirements in all of the uh, commissioning processes in order to have products uh, secure by default or, or at least having some cybersecurity requirements. And then assessment, this is also very important. We need to uh, understand if we are doing uh, the, the right things. If we have the control that we want to have and if we have the security level we want to have in our infrastructure. So for that, we need to uh, perform assessments periodically. And last but not least, some con conclusions, because uh, uh, we have been talking about products, processes, and persons, but we have some constraints. And we don't want to have the, 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 the more secure or the most secure company. We want, or, or let's say that cybersecurity needs to support our business goal. And this is key. We need to understand our business. And after that, we need to establish cybersecurity in order to support that new business in a digital world. We have also some technical constraints that we have to understand, regulation standard and, and law requirements, very important, and for sure, manufacturers and devices. We don't, we cannot do uh, whatever we want. We need to be uh, very, uh, we need to understand uh, the, the, the possibilities of our devices. Okay, this is also very important. So, uh, products, processes, and persons are key to uh, implement next generation substations. And this is everything from, from my part. Thank you, Arkit. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. So I'll ask you now to take your seat back in the audience and we'll get you back up on the screen at the end of the presentations for the Q&A section. Okay, thank you. thank you. So now I'm going to call up Mike Scharenberg. Mike Scharenberg. Uh, his session is uh, titled A Multi-Layered Defense in Depth Approach to Cyber Physical Security Substations. And Mike, um, uh, is in the role of consultant for operational technology at Young in the Netherlands. So just connecting with us now and here. Yeah, good afternoon. Hi, Mike. How are you? Yeah, very well. Yes. Excellent. So, um, yeah, I'm going to tell you something about how we uh, work at Kirion and how we cyber secure our digital substations, a multi layered defense in depth. I will focus on the employees, technology part, and the physical part. Uh, first off, I will tell you a little bit about Kirion so you get an understanding of where we work in what environment, the risk profiles we see as a company, and a multi-layer defense on the three subjects I just mentioned. Now, the corporate structure, maybe Aliende is more known than uh, Kirion for you guys, as well as uh, Leander, it's the grid operator, and we as Kirion focus on the high voltage department. There's every substation above 10,000 volts all the way to uh, 380,000 volts. We uh, build, design, and maintenance those grids. Also, a lot of other companies within the Alianda, but that's not a matter of today. And um, we got 1,200 uh, plus employees, around 240 million revenue, and our customers are Leander, uh, Tenet, uh, also a big one, ProRail, Gas Union, the NVGL, NXP, and some others. Uh, we mainly work in the Netherlands, in the uh, deep red area, 
and uh, the pink area will do some work as well. So this is the work area uh, at Kirin where we focus ourselves on. You see it from the transmission lines all the way till the substations uh, in your neighborhood. Uh, we maintain that. Uh, we do that uh, primarily the transformers, switch gear, cables, lines, buildings and terrain, everything. And secondary, we do all the decentral parts. So with the OT laptop, we configure and uh, commission everything there, all the way till the router and some parts of the telecom network as well. When we look on the bottom right, you see the central stations. Um, there's also a deep red that's uh, from Kirin as well. We configure some parts of our equipment from centralized areas. The control center is of course from Alienda, Tenet or another company. So we don't do anything in there. Um, looking at our risk profiles, now nah, we got plenty of them, but I uh, just uh, made four of them for you today. Uh, the first one is the Simon Script Kitty. He's 17 years old. He just thinks it's cool to hack and he wants the internal fame uh, on the hacker community. Then uh, a well-known one, the Sam from out of state. Uh, he is a, a government uh, state attacker, got plenty of resources. Then internal iris, now that's one we are focusing on a lot in Kirion. She's unsatisfied, but she also got way too many authorizations. And we, yeah, we're looking into that, how to reduce that. And if she wants to do harm, she can do a lot because of the authorizations. And the last one, Sloppy Stephen, is also for the awareness within the company. He doesn't really know why security is that important. And it just le tends to leave everything behind and prints out everything and loses a lot of stuff. Now, with those four uh, profiles, um, we, you will see the, uh, later on in the presentation on employees, technically and physical, we tend to make sure those are covered. Where on the right, internal Iris and Sloppy Stephen are mainly focused on, on our uh, yeah, employee part, awareness and um, e-learnings, etc. And on the left, we tend to uh, solve it with the technology and other breaches. Um, now, I'm going to talk uh, to you about what we do on the employee part, uh, the technology part, and the physical part. Now, it's in accordance with the ISO 27001, which are the main subjects of those as well, including organizations. Uh, first off, uh, employees. Now, new, uh, yeah, we've got three different types of uh, screening uh, within our company. The basic one, where you just uh, yeah, tend to see your diplomas, your CV, and some uh, reference checks. And in the past, uh, the management got screened more, uh, more intensively. They got background screening as well. Now, we said as Kirian, like the management can do harm, but also our people that work in the OT environment can do harm as well. So we're screening them now with background checks on a higher level. Now, we do that for new employees, uh, employees that transfer internally, as well as external contractors, because we think if we hire a contract, contractor, the level of screening has to be at least the same level as we have inside our company. And also when increased authorizations are given, you don't have to change function, but sometimes uh, an employee needs to go to the secured zone and when he wants access, he needs to get screened as well. Uh, looking at the awareness and attitude part, uh, we got e-learnings inside, toolboxes. We got intensive training programs as well as onboarding programs where all our new uh, employees have to go to and have to follow it. So they get an understanding of privacy and security. Now, lately we're seeing that phishing simulation tests are more and more uh, a threat. So, uh, or at least phishing is a threat and we do a simulation test to cover them and to raise awareness within the company as well. Instead of uh, blaming people they pushed on the phishing test, we're now like looking on the positive side. So every time someone, um, says a phishing and he uh, gets a notification of that and reports us to us, we give him one out of 10, a free uh, ticket to the cinema, just to encourage them to, uh, yeah, to yeah, notificate us. For the notification, we've got a central registration system uh, where they can report everything. Now, and that's the thing we want to do with our employees. Instead of just doing it alone and forcing them to do the e-learnings and toolboxes, we really want to collaborate with them. Uh, so we got a specialized security group with representatives of the OT department. Uh, we have meetings every month to talk about the security subjects. And uh, although for the other teams like a transformer team, a, a switchgear team, 
uh, which operates mainly primary. It's a less of a subject, but still we want to um, collaborate with them as well. So we uh, got once every quarter I'm meeting with them. Now, everything is uh, together within Aliander. We got the CISO office and from out there, we've got a connection to the law and uh, to the governments as well. Uh, when we look at the technology part, uh, our people uh, work with laptops and other devices. Uh, uh, we got a privileged access management system on those uh, devices. Uh, we monitor the actions and we limit those actions as well. Um, every uh, device and device they got is re registered. And um, looking at the OT devices like a Omicron, CPC 100, or CMC 356, a testing device, um, those are registered as well to the people. Mainly, they switch people throughout the week. But when you get the device, you have to put it on your name. And so you can follow where the devices are going. Um, looking at the software now, we don't want uh, people of the OT department going on the internet and downloading uh, everything themselves. So we got it uh, centralized in the software center. Uh, there is 99% uh, of our software available for people. They can install it and uh, they also get automatically the version updates of them. Um, the license keys, we uh, distribute them centrally through a server uh, without, uh, so they got all the license keys in hand. So they don't have to use USB drives, etc., to transfer license keys. Uh, looking at the backup and service, now we got the 24-7 uh, department that's for the configurations and settings we need of our grid in case we get hacked or something. We still got a backup where every setting is stored so we can uh, recover it. Um, also, we got an OT department 24-7 standby, of course, to maintain the energy grid, uh, to keep the lights burning, but we also got the IT department standby in case anything with the laptops or devices isn't working any, uh, anymore. And also at the IT department, we got spare laptops ready to run with all the software installed. So in case a commissioning engineer or someone uh, that needs to uh, restore the energy grid, uh, his laptops fails, he can get a new one instantly. Now, when we look at the fiscal part, of course, uh, we um, do it for uh, other companies like for Leander or Tenet. So the substations aren't ours, but we uh, yeah, tend to consult in those subjects as well. Um, at the substation, we got a lot of uh, stations you enter by key. We're looking into to get it into personal authentication with cards, etc. Uh, maybe even with biometrical authentication. Now, at the substation, we got cameras monitoring the place, at least at the high risk uh, substations. Um, and from centralized station, Leander got the OT traffic monitoring. So they got a SIM system and the intruder detection system and IDS. When we're looking, on, looking at our secured zones, that are the testing labs, that's where we test our configurations before they go into the, the electricity grid, so our testing zones. Um, the OTOP street for most, uh, I think, more known. We got personal authentication and we got surveillance uh, walking there when the, yeah, without um, after working hours. So nine to five people work there, afterwards surveillance is going around. And then it, also we got the highly secured zones. That's the central OT zone where we tend to configure our live uh, equipment in the grid, as well as the control center from Aliander. Uh, there you got the personal authentication, the surveillance going there, and of course, uh, the, of, of course, we got biometrical authentications. That's the weight of the people, for instance, and, and a fingerprint scanner, and may, maybe in the future as well an iris scanner. That was my uh, presentation I had for you guys. I'm uh, looking forward to your uh, questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so we're now going to call up Andreas. Andreas Clean from Omicron. And Andreas is going to be addressing the issue or the topic of state-of-the-art intrusion detection systems to ensure 24-7 monitoring and protection of substation assets. And Andreas is in the role of power grid cybersecurity expert at Omicron. Okay, over to you, Andreas. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar. So I've got uh, more of a technical topics today, focusing on intrusion detection systems in digital substations. I want to uh, present you three uh, main topics today. 
Uh, first one is some common pitfalls in the implementation of intrusion detection system projects in substations. Then second, some areas where IDS can help in OT security processes, as an example, asset inventory. And uh, towards the end, I would like to share with you some common security flaws that we found in security assessments performed in legacy substations and also in many digital substations. So buckle up, um, a lot of topics in a short presentation. So first part would be common pitfalls in the security IDS implementation projects. So we've uh, witnessed several IDS implementation projects now, uh, power plants and in uh, uh, substations, traditional station bus substations, many of them. And this is a, a real example, as we heard. So in the beginning of these security implementation projects are usually initiated by the IT department of a utility. And the OT engineers, they are not very much involved, uh, maybe to only to some extent. And so typically OT engineers think of, great, someone else takes care of security. That's really uh, nice. I'm happy that somebody takes care of this. But then along the implementation of the IDS, the protection and control engineers, so the OT engineers, they became more and more needed. So they asked, why is your device doing this and that? Why do you have this connection and that connection? And what does this particular alarm mean? And so on. And there was a SOC partner involved in, these, um, in, in, in this particular project I'm referring to. But this SOC partner also had IT people in, in the operations, in the security operations center. And so they always had to call the OT engineers with questions like uh, 61850 substation. So there were alerts similar to there's some confirmed request right on process variable, uh, blah, blah, blah. And um, so I, I guess many of you digital substation experts um, know that this is probably not a, a security threat, uh, but there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of such alerts per month in some over all the power plants which have been monitored and substations which have been monitored. And at some point, the OT engineers who, who always had to dig into these protocol details, also not their comfort zone, um, they started looking like this connection and that connection. And what does this particular alarm mean and so on? And there was a SOC partner involved in, these, um, in, in, in this particular project I'm referring to. But this SOC partner also had IT people in, in the operations, in the security operations center. And so they always had to call the OT engineers with questions like uh, 61850 substation. So there were alerts similar to there's some confirmed request right on process variable, uh, blah, blah, blah. And um, so I, I guess many of you digital substation experts um, know that this is probably not a, a security threat, uh, but there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of such alerts per month in some over all the power plants which have been monitored and substations which have been monitored. And at some point, the OT engineers who, who always had to dig into these protocol details, also not their comfort zone, um, they started looking like this. And so this is the key problem here, the key message here is that the OT engineers, the protection and control engineers responsible for the availability of the substation, they also need to be involved in those implementation projects. And also the IDS needs to know more of the OT system to be able to properly help there and to speed up the response process. And so actually in digital substations or in any other modern substation with a substation automation systems, um, there is a different approach possible. There is an approach possible which does not depend on a baseline based learning or AI approach. Because these devices in a substation automation system on the process bus and station bus, their function is actually quite known beforehand. It's known how these devices behave and it's known what they communicate and when. And with the 61850 substation, there is even an SCL file available. And this SCL file can also be used by the intrusion detection system to create a system model, an allow list, formerly called whitelist, um, of all the communication and then compare each and every packet um, against this whitelist and allow list. And if you're doing this in a bit more detail in a digital substation with the 61850 traffic, you can do 
a detailed verification of the behavior of the communication. And with that, you can not only detect the denial of service attack, you can also detect the failing service in the end. And this provides you not even not just more a higher level of security, but it provides you also functional monitoring capabilities to see if your digital substation is still working, operating correctly. So you're addressing security and general availability at the same time with such an approach, with such an intrusion detection system. And an additional benefit of this detailed verification is that you also are keeping track of other problems. You will detect configuration issues. Maybe it's malicious, an attack, or maybe it was a mistake that somebody put in a wrong configuration into a device. Such an IDS can also monitor the goose transmission time continuously to detect exceeding um, if, if the goose transmission or the, um, to, uh, exceeds a, cer a certain threshold. It can also detect time synchronization failures, which is especially crucial in a digital substation. And it can also log general events uh, like control commands and, and file transfer of disturbance records to have also um, not just for forensics in case of an attack, but to be also used for diagnosis if somebody is if something is not working properly. So what about other protocols? Of course, other protocols can also be supported with this approach, not just um, 61850. So this is also possible for OT protocols. And we are also uh, supporting more than 300 uh, different IT protocols with deep packet inspection. But my most important message here is that the intrusion detection system should understand a lot of the substation in order to enable a, a quick response process. This is an example of a, a screenshot of an IDS. So here we see an alarm going from a testing PC, the engineering uh, laptop that was mentioned before also. And we see immediately in the picture that the 320 kV voltage level, bay number one, uh, bay controller was involved. And also the alarm messages are clear, clearly understandable so that protection and control engineers and IT security officers can work together in diagnosing this alarm uh, quickly. So another point is how do you identify your risk? And the problem is here that security advisories and security vulnerabilities of devices such as this merging unit here or um, uh, network switches which are critical for the digital substation, all of this vulnerability um, information you need to know exactly which type and firmware version and network setup um, that you're using there in order to determine if you're at risk here. So for this, you need an asset inventory. And so you can either establish this by hand or you can also make use of um, IEC 61850 and the SCL file, for example, to automatically create a highly accurate asset inventory. So what can be done, for example, by an IDS in the network is it can do passive discovery to find all devices communicating in the network and all of them are potentially, potentially a risk and you can enumerate them in your asset inventory. And then um, you can do an active discovery using 61850 MMS to find out things like model, serial number, hardware version, and even the firmware version there to expand your table. But not always this information is present. Sometimes uh, um, or sometimes active discovery is not possible or um, not allowed. You can also use um, the SCL files to further um, make this asset inventory more complete. And with this approach of combining all of these discovery methods, including the SCL file, um, with this approach, you can um, make sure that your asset inventory of the digital substation is as complete and as detailed as it can be. And on the base of this, you can perform an efficient vulnerability um, assessment. So now I would like to share with you the top three issues found in uh, legacy substations. So um, we, when we conducted security assessments with, with our system, um, the IDS station guard, we found not only security issues, we found also functional issues. So we found um, 
for example, of course, a lot of IDs with known vulnerabilities, which is no surprise because we all know that protection and control devices are in many cases not patched frequently. But what was more interesting is that we almost always saw more external IP connections going into the substation network than expected. And it was typically different departments um, involved there and different departments connecting, having their individual IP connections into to equipment in the substation. And so um, the network guy is managing the switches and uh, protection guy is managing their devices. What we also found uh, in the top three is gateways, RTUs, with unnecessary services running, which are these services are also exposed and visible and communicating on the network. But we also found functional issues, NTP time synchronization configuration errors. Um, in many cases, network issues. So RSTP reconfigurations, um, mistakes in the RSTP and in the VLAN configuration. And in some cases, we also discovered RTU uh, configuration errors, MMS config, um, com communication issues there. And so this was what we found in legacy substations. We also conducted this in many digital substation pilot projects and um, there uh, over the last four years. And so we found similar security flaws as with legacy substations. We found slightly more unexpected communication issues with uh, so even sometimes unexpected sample value streams because these projects tend to be a bit more hacky where, where people um, uh, change configurations frequently and so on. Um, on the other hand, we did not find functional issues in the network communication because in process bus projects, network issues tend to be found earlier. And so when we came into the project uh, to do the security assessment, we found um, uh, no network issues anymore in those substations with process bus. So um, this brings me to the conclusion. So there are many attack vectors that bypass the firewall. So an intrusion detection system makes sure that communication from within the network with people plugging in their OT um, engineering laptops, with um, external connections coming in through uh, tunnels, for example, all of this communication is visible. And um, for this, IDS makes sense and can help you in many phases of the security processes. And for this, there are tailor-made intrusion detection systems available for the power grid. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Fantastic. Right, so we're going to invite the other two speakers back up. So let's have Mike and Arcades. But so let's get started, Arcades, with, with the first question, which is how, do, uh, how does microgrid protection differ from digital substation protection? Basically, it's what I mentioned in, in, in my presentation. And uh, I mean, th there is a, a, a big discussion about if this is OT or IT or what type of device or, or this is the IT side of the company or the OT side of the company. I always like to say that we need to protect based on the on the on the risk. Okay, so. Uh, so to protect a, an infrastructure, you need to have uh, very clear the, the risk of all the, the source of the infrastructure that, that you have uh, over there. And once that you have that uh, asset inventory in order to, to understand what you have there, uh, the security architecture is it's key because uh, otherwise it's almost impossible to, to protect. Monitoring, visibility, it's also very important. Uh, Andreas mentioned uh, these ideas and the for substation. So uh, basically we are following always the same approach, okay? But then specifically to devices and to uh, attacks, to protocols that we are using in the uh, different parts of the, of the smart grid. Okay, but uh, commissioning, uh, 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 cybersecurity architecture, and uh, basically injecting uh, cybersecurity in the NDA of, the, of our organization. That, that's key from, from my part. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Okay, so we have another question here. This one is for Mike. Uh, Mike, what is the realization rate of the um, security measures in place, theory against re reality? Yeah, if we're looking at um, the subjects we had, we had uh, employees, uh, that's all in place. 
So with the screening uh, that is in place, when we look at the physical department, so all the cameras at the substations, they are not yet in place. Um, only at the most uh, vulnerable substations, we got cameras. And looking at the personal identification at the substations, it's still in uh, development. We got some pilots running, but every other area, so um, the test labs, as well as the secured OPs and the employees, everything I said is in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a thank you, Mike. We have a question here about IC61850 vulnerabilities. Uh, do any of the panelists have any views on that? Yeah, we are looking every, uh, very much into 61850 vulnerabilities. So we do have a research team looking into the uh, vulnerabilities in protection and control devices involves the 61850 communication. Uh, what the challenge is there is um, to um, the there are some vulnerabilities uh, published which are related to 61850, but you have to know a lot uh, to, to understand that this is affecting you in a 61850 substation and how it is affecting you and what you should do to protect against it, except, of course, um, updating your, your firmware on, on a protection relay. Um, what we see is uh, what is also difficult there is to be able to match uh, the vulnerabilities published to the devices that you have in, in in, in your asset inventory. So suppose you have a properly set up very detailed asset inventory. The problem is that many of the vulnerabilities published by those vendors are um, at best a PDF file uh, covering some of the uh, devices which are affected. But we've uh, did some research there that um, many cases, much more devices are affected than what is noted in the in the in the published vulnerability, and also in many cases the mitigation steps do not match the actual vulnerability there. That uh, the vulnerability is much larger than um, what what would be covered by the mitigation steps. Okay. Any other um, anything else to add to to that answer? No, I, I think that uh, this, I mean, uh, in terms of, of attacking or protecting a substation, this could be one of the last layers. <clears throat> okay, so because, I mean, we, we are protecting the, the perimeter, we are deploying some uh, cyber security of the and protocol, the protocol, and then uh, we are talking about, about products that they have to be compatible with uh, this uh, standard. So it's not the, the, the easiest task to uh, to protect and, and to face in, in, in the protection of the substation. Okay, and we'll go to our next question. Um, so uh, we ha have someone who wants to say thank you very much for the wonderful session. Uh, does passive NW monitoring devices baselining work in the substation communication stack? Yeah, I would like to take that. So mm -hmm. passive network monitoring, I I do recommend to do the IDS network monitoring passive um, since uh, influencing the process bus or station bus and the, the activities uh, in a substation can be quite dangerous to, if you if you if the IDS by itself starts uh, terminating connections and and kicking uh, clients out. Um, but uh, the other question, uh, it is was also related to the baselining approach. I touched it a bit in my presentation. So the pure baselining and learning based approach has the disadvantage of a lot of false alarms, as I presented there. And then at some point, you will always need uh, protection and control engineers to help you with this, uh, with all of those false alarms. So um, an approach is needed where you can put in the specific this uh, with all of those false alarms. So um, an approach is needed where you can put in the specification of the substation, um, for example, by SCL file, and then based on this specification, the IDS already has a very sophisticated baseline, which also covers uh, seldom activity like maintenance and uh, um, switching operations, protection trips, um, and, um, and, and these uh, things, and they should not trigger false alarms. Otherwise, um, it will never get to a productive phase where you have an acceptable level of uh, false alarms. Oh, thank you, Andreas. So just going back on the question raised by Bruno, 
So the question was, uh, being involved in a project where the virtualization of a power grid is the main goal, so IED virtualization, and um, being new, what are the more important aspects to focus on since we're at the very beginning um, with cybersecurity? So what are the priorities? That's a tough Mike. question. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I'm would you like to? I'm still searching to, um, he wants to fit, uh, virtualize a, a normal common IED into a software and then operates that way if i'm good with the I question so. then i should yeah i should mainly focus on everything that's done by the companies in the past because they got years of experience mm -hmm. and we have done the same within alianda with um uh, we tried to uh, or at least we did fertilize some of our components and uh, that's a si sensor it's called and uh, yeah we looked at well as well uh, a lot to the other companies that uh, yeah went before it's like a Siemens and ABB, all the major companies, what did they do? And uh, the main thing is don't lose uh, what this is all about when you fertilize is about the protecting the grid. So it's the security is one thing, but make sure it operates like an IED. It has to operate like an IED. I think that's the main thing. Don't lose the main focus of the goal. And security is a second part of it. Okay. So does that answer the question, Bruno? Oh, you want to? In that case, I, I will look to uh, to see a backup of that if you uh, mm -hmm. tend to everything in one. Yeah, I think it's more of an availability question than a security yeah. question. I think securing such a system is quite similar as to secure physical IDs and uh, and and SCADA HMI devices. Um, they are all on the network. Then it's a virtual network. But so securing this uh, substation is. Uh, analogous to, to securing a, a physical device substation yeah. but in terms of availability uh, you need to make sure that you have uh, a backup stack of that uh, which is um, hot swappable or on hot standby to to switch yeah. over to these yeah but adding just something here and it's, it's important to understand that you have like two parts to protect you need to protect your host and this is important because you are hosting that virtual machine in, in, in the physical device so you need to protect that in a physical way and the, and, the, and the host communications with the virtual machine and then you have the virtual machine itself that it, it is a, another machine that you have to protect like a like a host okay but both are very important to to have into consideration and then for sure the uh, all the backups and you can do in in a very easy way with uh, these uh, virtual machines so it's Yeah. I can also imagine scenarios where a um, manipulated SCADA or HMI virtual machine could have an effect on the IED, which is running on the same host. So you need to consider these scenarios. Um, if you if you um, uh, um, assign the pro um, um, processing priorities properly so to cover yeah. these scenarios, for example. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, so we have a qu another question here for Mike. Um, this is from Bruno de Bloch. Mike, a camera at a substation is one thing, but what's done with the images? Is there automatic yeah. processing of bad actions? Yeah, uh, behind the cameras, there's just, a, uh, how you say that, uh, a center that analyzes movement, etc. just 24-7 uh, by people. So it's um, just like a police uh, does the... Uh, looking at uh, the cameras in the streets, uh, we do that just with a, a center that's behind it that looks at it as well. Right. So they monitorize 24-7 uh, all the footage. And of course, they get help from the technology if movement is detected, etc. Mm -hmm. But it's still uh, done by persons. Okay. Uh, another question here from Tibor Pollen. Um, what IT security solutions can be applied in, in the OT world and what's not applicable? For example, is shared um, CM, is that how you say it? S-I-E-M, and shared SOC, good idea. I can go with that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, basically uh, it's, for example, if we are talking about SOC and monitoring tools, uh, you need to be aware that if you want to monitor the service, protocols that you are using in substation. So that's key. It's not talking about IT or OT because maybe you have an IT tool that uh, it uh, supports this protocol, so you can use it. But generally speaking, there are specific solutions for OT that you should use. And then going further into the, 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 the short part of the, of the question, 
uh, it's important from my point of view to to have a unique dashboard uh, in terms of cybersecurity. Okay, so you have the, the overall view of uh, security, uh, having the alerts coming from the IT side and the OT side. In the OT side, you can uh, deploy specific OT technology to monitor that part of the infrastructure that uh, talks and supports the protocol that we are using in that specific part. And then in the IT side, you can use Splunk or the typical ones that we use in, in the IT field. So then you have everything uh, combined view because if you understand the, uh, the the attack chain most of the attacks start in the in the it side of, of the organization so you need to be aware uh, of that uh, before they go to the OT side okay so uh, basically uh, understand what you need uh, the protocol that you are using and uh, and work on that spe those specific solutions for for ot okay any other thoughts on this yeah um so I'm here, of course, to present an OT specific or power grid specific IDS solution. So uh, to me, of course, this makes sense, but I really like the second part. The second question here, is it a good idea to have a shared seam and a shared SOC for OT and IT? Because I've been asking this question a couple of times to uh, utilities and also I've been asking this a couple of times to SOC as a service providers and they're giving different answers. So, so, so sometimes utilities respond to this with, of course, not at all possible, not at all acceptable. We need a separate SOC for IT and OT, no communication between the two areas um, or um, the, uh, the, we need OT people uh, uh, there and so we cannot have IT people sitting in a SOC for, for OT. Um, SOC as a service provider, they say, of course, it needs to be combined because they have uh, provided uh, in a combined way and they just uh, train their staff for OT uh, topics. And so, however you do it, it's very important to get OT knowledge into the SOC um, and to use solutions so that this information is available in the SOC. Okay, great. We've got a general question here. In your opinions, for everyone on the panel, do you perceive a challenge in addressing OT security with IT security focused teams within the customer organization? Yeah, definitely. OT and IT is in a different field and you tend to see it a lot within the companies as well. And where IT people constantly want to update everything and that's not possible with our, in the OT field. And I think that's the main difference. You got all the um, yeah, controls of all the devices within hand, so they can push updates, everything. And looking at our own grid, we uh, yeah, almost got the whole land lens and not everything is connected yet. So uh, it's impossible to do uh, that. And to, yeah, that mindset with the legacy systems, etc., it's hard to uh, transfer that from OT people to IT people. It's mm -hmm. a different mindset. Any alternative views here on the panel or would you all agree? And I want to um, add to that where IT, um, they don't, they want to update to make it new, but at OT, we just want to keep it running. So not always updates are necessary. We just want to keep it running to protect mm -hmm. the energy grid. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Andreas and Arcades, would you be in agreement with that? Or do you think? Yeah, so we've seen several, as I presented also an example there, uh, huge conflicts sometimes between the OT and IT departments. IT solutions forced upon OT uh, engineers who have uh, different uh, situations altogether and also a problem of IT solutions speaking a completely different language than OT engineers. Mm -hmm. And so we are really trying our best to bridge this gap between IT and OT um, to bring these two sides uh, together. Okay. Well, sorry, go ahead, Arcades. No, 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 totally agree, totally agree. But in the, in the same way, we have seen uh, this side and they need to connect something. They, they they aren't aware about cybersecurity, so they just connect to uh, to, to work it the, the device and connect it, one device with, with the other one. So they are not thinking in cybersecurity. So at the end of the day, it's it's about about awareness. All all all, all the employees need to understand uh, cybersecurity and have a, like a, an overall view of of the the attacks and the impact that we can have in in our infrastructures. And that's that's mm -hmm. my point. 
Okay, we are due to wrap up now, but we do have a few more questions. So would it be okay with the speakers if we continue for another five or so minutes? Fine with me. Sure. Yeah. yeah? Okay, yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Because uh, it's always great if we can cover off all the questions here. So, um, Mike, regarding the IDS, having um, taking into account pre the previous questions from Bruno Pino, um, who asked about the virtualized IEDs, um, since we'll be implementing an IDS, what will be the best OU better option? The best OU better option, a host based, network based, or even maybe virtual machine based? Yeah, I uh, don't really know the answer to that. The IDS is uh, from Leander and they're the expertise on that. So, yeah, it's not my uh, field of expertise. Uh, so, I think I cannot give a, a fulfilling answer to that. Maybe one of the others. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can go with that if you want. Uh, basically, in, in this kind of infrastructure, we are using uh, passive monitoring tools. So uh, we are not going to a host base because for that you need to, to install something in, in, in a device. So uh, basically, we add a new device to the infrastructure in the for mirroring of the switch or something like that in order to uh, to, to cut factor. So that's uh, the, the key point of, of, of this and the, the main goal of all of this. Okay, so we can introduce something new, but uh, we cannot add any noise into the network uh, because we are having, or in our hands are a very uh, important uh, infrastructures. Okay. And uh, one more question. What is the necessity to implement OT security in the substation network? Station bus 61850, T bus IC 104, since it's not connected with the internet. Yeah, the necessity is lower than uh, the other fields. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So it's not the first thing you're looking at. Uh, we're looking at it like from a pilot point of perspective. We're not um, implementing it right now. Like yeah. so, uh, this shown in other states <clears throat> by Andreas. Because that's also a lot of um, reviewing has to be done by the OT, OT personnel. And we already short staffed on those. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much for your contributions. Thanks to our speakers, our Kate, Andreas, Mike, thank you for your presentations. It's been really valuable. And to all of our audience, I hope you've enjoyed it and found it really informative and productive. Thanks for all your questions as well. Um, and then finally, we're taking a break in December, but we'll be back at the end of February with our webinar on cybersecurity and control centers. So we look forward to seeing you on the platform then. And for now, have a very good evening and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video insightful and enjoyable. We post new Smart Grid related videos every Friday at 12 CET. So please go ahead and subscribe and let colleagues in other departments and peers in other organizations know so that they can benefit too. We welcome your feedback. So if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to post them below. Thanks again and have a great day.